Well, good morning, church. Hey, do you know what it is? It's one and a half weeks until Christmas. Are you ready? No? Um, when I say, are you ready, I don't mean, are you ready, like, do you have all your presents ready? I mean, are you ready for worshiping? I had a, a meal with someone this week, and, and they asked me, hey, what are you doing? How are you preparing your heart for Christmas? And I'm ashamed to say I didn't have a good answer. And that was like, ah, an eye-opening moment for me. Like, what have I been doing? You know, it's, it's the season where it's easy to be busy. It's easy to be filling up your calendar with all sorts of good things. But in the midst of that busyness, who are we focused on? Who are we worshiping in that busyness? Christ or self? Two and a half weeks until the end of the year. And 2019 is coming to a close very quickly. What would it look like for you to glorify God in the remainder of your year? Have you started thinking about, how am I going to grow in 2020 in the pursuit of holiness? Right? This is the time to be doing that. It's the time to be thinking about those questions. I hope that as you've been in the study of Proverbs this year, that the Lord would bring back to remember some of the ways he's challenged you and encouraged you to grow. And you would be thinking, what will that look like next year? What steps will I take? I want to challenge us as a church to finish well in 2019, to have our eyes on Christ. And in fact, that's actually what we're going to be spending our church-wide prayer meeting later today focused on. Later today here at 4.30 in the afternoon, we're going to be back here, so you're invited uh, to come and just seek the face of the Lord and say, God, we want, to, we want to have our eyes on you. We want to have our worship focused on you, especially this time of the year, but frankly, all of the year. Would you please help us do that? Help us to finish 2019 well and help us to enter into 2020 with a desire to pursue you. So I'd love to have you back tonight for our churchwide prayer night in order to seek the face of the Lord on that. I also want to make sure I say thank you to everyone who participated in the giving tree back there. If you notice on the way in, uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of gifts under the tree. Um, and it is so encouraging to see that every week when we put tags up on the tree, you guys were just as quick to go over there and pull them off the tree and meet a need. Praise God for his work in your life. That's evidence that you are practicing the very things we've been talking about this fall. Radical generosity, being good stewards, thank you for doing that. And if you didn't remember, today is the drop-off day for that, so um, feel free to come back to church family night or the prayer night later today at 4.30 if you forgot your gift and join us for prayer. So tie those two in together there. If you are new, I'm glad to have you here. I should probably introduce myself. My name is Nick Lees, and I serve as a senior pastor, and I have the privilege of opening up God's word with you today. And as you already uh, heard, we've been in the book of Proverbs this fall, and you've joined us in the last few weeks of this series. And so uh, what we've been doing is we've been going through a series called The Pursuit of Wisdom, and we've been learning about how there's two ways to live, right? That's, that's what the Proverbs have been teaching us. And so those are shown by the two uh, doors we've got over here. So this is the way of wisdom, and its end is life. And over here is the way of folly, and its end is death and destruction. And over the last few months, we've been unpacking, well, what does that look like as we live out our day-to-day -day lives? Specifically, in the last two months, we've been tracing themes through the book of Proverbs. We've talked about how do we handle anger? How do we handle finances? How do we handle discipling others, parenting, things like that? What does it look like to walk down the way of wisdom in those issues versus what does it look like to walk down the path of folly? in those issues. And today, we're talking about the wisdom of humility. So we're going to be unpacking the topics of pride and humility according to Proverbs. Now this was, a, for me, an exciting sermon to prepare for because there is a lot of stuff in Proverbs about pride and humility. And so I'm like, preacher's dream, you got plenty of things to choose from. But at the same time, it was also very, a bit nerve-wracking because, let's be honest, who is qualified to preach on humility? Jesus Christ, right? The humble one, certainly. But Nick Lees? Oh, no. No, not at all. And so here's the deal. As, as we go through the message today, as we study God's word, please know that this is me preaching to myself, and you have the benefit of listening in on a sermon to me, okay? Um, but I'm praying that all of us would learn, right? How can we put off pride and pursue humility for the glory of God? Well, at this time, I'm going to have our ushers come forward with the Bibles. If you're here and you don't have a copy of a, of a Bible with you, you can put your hand in the air. They will gladly give you a word of, a word of God to use. 
uh, because we want everyone to be able to study it for themselves this morning. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament, to the book of Proverbs. That's page 449 of the Bible that's being handed out to you right now. And as you turn there, I just want to share a little personal lesson here um, from my life. So, you know, every week I'm preparing for a sermon on Sunday, and what often happens, the pattern is, as I'm working through the, the text for the week, I see an uptick of spiritual warfare in my life. It's, a, it's been an amazing thing, but it's also been very frustrating to see like the very things that I'm studying about in the Word suddenly become a battleground in my life. But it's not very surprising, I suppose, when you consider what's happening here is God's Word is washing my heart anew with, with some truth. right? And so then uh, I have the opportunity to respond to it. And there's war right there. There's, there's an opportunity to choose wisdom or folly. And wouldn't you know it that in the middle of this week, Wednesdays are my, my big sermon prep day, and so I'm, I'm spending all day long you know, studying the scriptures, reading about pride and humility, learning all sorts of great stuff, and then I go home, and I choose to be a proud fool. I took something that was a preference issue in a discussion with my wife, and I elevate it to a selfish sin opportunity, right? That's, that's what pride does. God, help me. And thankfully... Holy Spirit was faithful. He was quick to show up and convict and help me see that you're being a fool. You know that you're being a fool. Stop going down the path of folly. And my lovely wife was willing to be patient with me, and she was trying to speak truth to me and remind me that this was folly. And so by God's grace, I was able to confess, and I was able to say, I don't want this. I don't want to walk down this path. But pride is so sneaky, and it's ever-present. I have to be aware of that. Let me share with you something that famous author and theologian C.S. Lewis said about pride. He had some very strong words to say. He said this, Well now, we have come to the center. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, grief, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every vice. It is a complete anti-God state of mind. Some pretty strong words there. Uh, How can Mr. Lewis be so confident that 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 is how God views pride? Well, let's define pride. What is pride? I'm benefiting here from Pastor Stuart Scott in an article he wrote for the Journal of Biblical Counseling called Pursuing the Servant's Mindset. Here's what he says. What's the definition of pride? Pride. If we could sum it up, it's the mindset of self, the pursuit of self-exaltation, a focus on the desire to control all things for self. In exalting himself, the person actually believes, I am valuable and worthy. I am the source of anything good or wise or successful. I deserve the credit for whatever I achieve or acquire. I deserve love admiration, and respect. All good things are from me, through me, and to me. All honor and glory should go to me for my enjoyment and pleasure. And do you hear what that that statement is saying? I, 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 me, 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 right? All about self, not about the Lord at all. If we were going to summarize this, pride is sinful human beings putting themselves in God's position and refusing to acknowledge their dependence on him. I put myself where God is, and I say, I don't need you, God. I'm enough. Now, most of us probably wouldn't admit to thinking that way or speaking like that. But if we're being honest, it's there, hidden deep in our hearts, in our inner man, in our inner woman. It shows up when we treat others poorly, when we act like, you are such an inconvenience to me, You're in my way. It rears its ugly head when a a wrench gets thrown into our plans for the day. And how do we respond? Sinful anger. It gets uh, revealed when we bask in the pride or the, the praises of others. When they say, oh, look at how great you are. You did such a good job. And your response is, yeah, I know. Keep it on. Bring it on. Instead of saying, no, the glory goes to God for anything good in my life. Right? Those things are pride. 
the complete anti-God state of mind. It takes what is rightfully his and puts it on self. It's all about me. There are a lot of words in the Bible that are used for pride. Vainglory, conceit, boasting, arrogance, scoffing, to name a few. You'll hear some of them today. But here's one that you might not expect to hear. Self-pity. Would you believe me if I told you that self-pity is a form of pride? I mean, think about what self-pity is. It's pride not getting what it wants. I deserve, you fill in the blank, but I'm not getting it. Come on, God, don't you see that I'm worthy of this? That's pride talking right there. Pride failing to get what it wants and believes that it deserves. So if that's pride, what is humility? Let's define it. Again, benefiting from Pastor Stuart Scott. He says the terms used in the Hebrew and the Greek for this character of humility all refer to bowing low or crouching. Bowing low used to be a sign of of submission and oppression in the Old Testament, an attitude of mind of one who bends down. It's an attitude of heart, Pastor Scott says. It's the real you. It means to bring low, to yield, to give way to God's way. He goes on to say this, humility is the pursuit to magnify Christ by bowing low in complete adoration and obedience. It's the pursuit of magnifying Christ, not self, realizing that all goodness, honor, and glory comes from God and needs to go to God. It confesses that anything good, wise, or helpful comes from him and is done by him or through him, and the goal is for him. Such, is, such a mind is what Christ displayed when he was here. Right? It's a complete opposite mindset and character quality than pride. And if we were going to summarize humility, you might put it this way. Humility is having a right view of God and a right view of self that leads you to worship him. A right view of God and a right view of myself that leads me to worship him. It's making much of him and less of me. Of being willing to say, God, your will, your way, not mine. And to be able to say something like that with a joyful heart. It's not drudgery. It's exciting when I realize who God is and how worthy he is of worship. Of course I want to live his will and his way. It's so much better than mine. But as we think about that, that's not where we start life. That's not something we do on our own. We can't be humble apart from God working in and through us. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. I'll just offer this. If, if you're interested in hearing more from that article, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to share it with you. But we've got some definitions on the table now for pride and humility. So now let's tackle well, what does the Bible say about pride and humility? Right? So if you have your bulletin here, you'll notice the question on the top says, what does God say about pride and humility? That is the question that we're seeking to answer. And so uh, if you've got your Bibles open, go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 8. We're going to look at Proverbs 8 verse 13 together to get started. And I'll just say this, if you're antsy already, if you're like, when are we going to get to the blanks? Just calm down. I know it's been a long time already. Uh, We've still got a ways to go. So feel free to write all over the bulletin, right underneath point one, and uh, we'll get to the blanks, okay? So Proverbs 8, verse 13, as we go into this passage, I just want to point out, here's what's happening. Uh, Wisdom is being personified here as Lady Wisdom, and she's speaking to King Solomon's son. And so she's giving him some instructions, some teachings on her ways. And so let's read now in Proverbs 8, verse 13, about what she says. She says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Well, there you have it. Pretty straightforward, right? Wisdom hates pride and arrogance. They're linked right here with the way of evil and perverted speech. She wants nothing to do with them. And the the attitude that she has here is encapsulated in the first few words, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. If you've been in our series of Proverbs for a while now, it's not the first time that phrase has come up. The fear of the Lord is something we heard in the very first chapter of Proverbs, and we've heard it throughout. So take your fingers and go back to chapter 1 now, Verse 7, let's look at what the fear of the Lord is. 
Proverbs 1 verse 7 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is a passage that helps us understand if you want to obtain wisdom, if you want to walk in the way that, that pleases the Lord, if you want to have life, then you must fear the Lord. A fool has no fear of the Lord, and so therefore they have no wisdom. They have no instruction. The fear of the Lord is one of the primary keys to understanding the book of Proverbs. So what is it? What is the fear of the Lord? We've defined it before. Let's define it again. It's this. The fear of the Lord means to have an awe and a reverence of God that leads to obedience of his commands. It's to have an awe and a reverence of God that leads to obedience of his commands. Earlier this fall, I summarized it like this. It's a right view of God that leads to a right response to God. A right view of God that leads to a right response to God. I see how great he is. I see how worthy he is. And I can't help but want to worship him and obey him and live for him. Now, if you're thinking, if you're paying attention to what we've already defined humility as, these definitions are very similar. Remember, humility is having a right view of God and self that leads me to worship him. That's very similar to what we've just defined the fear of the Lord as. Do you think they might be connected in any way? The answer is absolutely they are. And Proverbs does this connection for us. It helps us see it in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. In Proverbs 22, verse 4, the writer says this, The reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That the two are tied together, humility and fear of the Lord. You have to have a right view of God if you're going to have humility. And the result, we hear here, is tremendous blessings. God wants us as his created beings to have a right view of him. And to have a right response to him. He wants us to worship him. And when you do have that accurate view of God, when you do have awe and reverence for him, that produces humility in you. It produces that character in you. But conversely, if you don't have awe and reverence of God, if you don't fear the Lord, that also produces a certain kind of character in you. Can you guess what kind of character that produces? Pride, right? Pride. We saw it in chapter 8, verse 13. Those things are at odds, fear of the Lord and pride. We're also going to see it in chapter 21, verse 24. Here's what Proverbs 21, 24 says. Scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. There's quite a few terms there. Proverbs uses the word scoffer to define the person who is arrogant and haughty and acts with arrogant pride. A lot of very similar words just kind of layered on top of each other to describe this person. And none of them are positive. You don't want these used of you. Right? King Solomon's saying this is someone who's disrespectful, someone who's rude, someone who's quick to anger, who looks down on others, who's overconfident in themselves. This is a person who has an inflated view of self which is exactly what we heard about earlier, pride. They boast, not in God, but in themselves. And so just like the fear of the Lord, this, this term scoffer is also a theme of the book of Proverbs. It comes up over and over again. I want to point back to one of the passages we've already read earlier this fall in chapter 9. Go back to chapter 9 and let's read verses 7 through 10 and remind ourselves of how different a scoffer is from the wise. Proverbs 9, 7 through 10 says this, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So in, in this passage, we see these connections being made. Yet again, the fear of the Lord is connected to wisdom. And the scoffer is connected to pride and folly. They're tied together. 
A wise person fears the Lord. They know who God is, right? They have a right view of God that leads to a right response to God. They worship him. They want to live in obedience to him. They want to put off selfishness. They want to live in a way that honors Christ, that loves God and loves others. And as we hear in this passage, when you correct someone who's humble, when you correct someone who fears the Lord, they're willing to receive it. They want to grow. They want to change. They want to be holy as he is holy. But uh, that's not always how the proud person responds. The proud person has a much different response. And so what this passage is teaching us is you can know whether you're humbled or proud by the way that you respond when someone confronts you or when someone comes alongside of you to seek to help you, to teach you a better way. Right? Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to receive that confrontation? Or do you respond with anger? Do you respond with sin? I don't want to hear what you have to say. I don't care about that. That reveals whether you're a proud fool or a humble learner. All right, verses 7 and 8 says, here's how the fool responds. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. That's how a proud fool acts. Right? They think, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm going to do what's right in my eyes. I don't care what you have to say or what God has to say. Right? They'll go in the face of what God's will and his ways are because they think they know better. And we've talked about this before, but if you were to think of folly as this spectrum, right, you've got the fool kind of on the entry side of the spectrum, and then the scoffer is far down the path. There's a person, this is a person who's doubled down on their folly. They are hardened in their heart. They have no interest in hearing truth. They're hostile to the truth, which is why they respond so vehemently against those who would try to speak it to them. If you're here and you know someone, you have someone in your family, workplace, neighborhood, that's a scoffer, I want to encourage you to be in prayer for them, right? That the Lord, the Holy Spirit would convict them, would break them, would help them to understand their need for God's grace and wisdom in their life. You won't change them. They're not willing to listen to you. They're only willing to hear when God breaks them through his Holy Spirit. And if you're here this morning and you are the scoffer, first of all, I'm glad you're here. And please know that I'm praying for you, that your heart would be broken today, that you would be brought to the end of yourself and realize you can't do it on your own. You weren't made to do it on your own. And God has a better way. So I'd encourage you to be praying for those folks in your life. This finally brings us to our first takeaway. So if you're one that wants to fill in the blank, here is our takeaway. What does God say about pride and humility? Your demeanor reveals your disposition. Your demeanor reveals your disposition. Another way of saying that is your behavior reveals your character. Your behavior reveals your character. Demeanor means behavior. Disposition means character. And the point that that I'm trying to make here is what you say, how you behave, what you're thinking, that reveals the kind of person that you are whether you're proud or whether you're humble, whether you're a scoffer or whether you're someone who fears the Lord. We've already begun to see how that plays out, right, when you're confronted. Already we've heard that the fool, the scoffer doesn't respond well, but the proud person is willing to grow, willing to listen, willing to admit, I don't have it all figured out. I need your help. Right? That is the difference in how they behave. And therefore, it reveals, okay, this person who's not willing to receive confrontation, they're proud. We can learn that about them. This person who's humble and willing and able able to listen and grow in holiness, uh, they are a humble person. And whether or not you're willing to receive counsel is directly linked to how you view yourself. That's what Proverbs tells us. It's your perception of self. Uh, In the book of Proverbs, it's, it's titled this way, wise or right in his own eyes. Wise or right in his own eyes comes up over and over again. Let me show you one example from Proverbs 12, verse 15. In Proverbs 12, 15, it says this, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Right, so as you look at that little passage there, 
Which person is it? The proud or the humble who is wise in his own eyes, who thinks he's got it all together? It's the proud person, right? They are the one who thinks they know it all. They are called the fool. They're not willing to listen. They think that they're better than others. So let's stop for a minute. And I want you to think about the last month of your life. How have you responded when people have sought to come alongside of you, either in confrontation, to call you out on something, or just to say, hey, brother, or hey, sister, hey, honey, I see this in your life and I'm concerned, right? They're seeking to instruct you, to help you. What has your response been? Have you said, oh my goodness, you're right, I need to hear. I, help me to understand, what are you seeing? Or has it been, I don't want to hear from you, keep that to yourself. I'm fine, thank you very much. Right, your behavior reveals your character. And uh, as I was typing that, as I was working on the sermon, the Lord was opening my eyes some more, as he graciously does, and I was reflecting on even my own interactions in my own home, in my own family, and I realized, oh my gosh, Lord, I am a proud, arrogant man. I so often enter into conversations assuming my way is the right way. And perhaps sometimes it is, perhaps most of the time it is, but I should not enter into the conversation assuming that. I should enter into the conversation wanting to hear from whoever is involved, not saying, no, just get behind me and follow me. One is arrogance, the other is seeking to be humble. What about you? How do you treat your family? How do you treat your friends? How do you act in the workplace? Do you come into conversations thinking, it's my way or the highway? Get behind me, get in line. Or are you willing to hear from everyone and to consider what is the best way? How about this? When you're in small group, we have an accountability portion of that. How do you respond when your brothers or sisters seek to hold you accountable? Hey, you said you wanted to grow in this. What, what steps did you take? Or, hey, I saw you did this or posted this on social media. What about that? Do you immediately put the walls up and say, uh-uh, we're not talking about that? Or do you invite that in and say, you're right. I do need to hear and I do need to change. Let me point you to another example of how your demeanor reveals your disposition. Proud people don't seek help. Proud people don't seek help. Now we're looking at Proverbs 15, verse 12, which says, A scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. All right, so now, not only does pride lead us to respond poorly when some come to us to confront us, now we hear that pride actually prevents us from even wanting to go to others and receive help. We're not even going to ask I don't want you to know that I have problems. And who doesn't have one of these stories, right, where you're, you know, on a road trip, driving in a new place. Before you know it, you take a wrong turn, right, and I'm not sure where you're at. Do you stop and ask for directions? Of course not. I'm a man, right? My intuitive manliness will get us where we need to go. I don't need anyone's opinion about that. Ladies, do you ever feel like you have to prove yourselves? whether it's in the workplace or in the home, like, I measure up. I don't need anyone else's help. I've got this. Right? What, what is motivating these kind of responses, these kind of thoughts, thinking, behavior, speech? It's pride. It's pride. Whether we're men or women, we need to realize it's okay to ask for help. We're not meant to be sufficient. We weren't created to be. We need God. We need one another. Think about that couple in the car again, right? They're on the road. Let's see, let's see what we sound like when we've got a proud couple in the car versus a humble couple on that trip. So let's start with the proud couple, right, who's lost. Are you lost? I knew it. I should have drove. I would have never gotten us into this situation. I can't believe it. It's happened again. I'm not lost. I'm just taking the scenic route. <laughs> we'll get there. Don't worry about it. Keep your mouth shut. Right? So there's the proud couple. What about the humble couple? Honey, are you lost? Um, seems like we're not going where we said we were going to be going. Should we stop and ask for directions? How can I help? 
yeah, uh, I took a wrong turn. I'm not really sure where we're at right now. Can you please keep your eyes open for somewhere where we can stop and ask for directions? Or as we know now in the 21st century, can you please get out your phone, sweetie, <laughs> and uh, pull up the GPS and get us where we need to go? Right, two completely different car rides. And the next hours after that are going to go much differently in each of those cars, right? And uh, we've all probably been in a situation like that. And I was laughing because I was thinking about, you know, getting the mic and just setting it up here and saying, all right, testimony time. Who wants to come up and share? (laughs) I bet we would be here until prayer night tonight. So we all have these stories, right? We struggle because we're people that are proud. We struggle with this. One other way that our demeanor reveals our disposition is shown in Proverbs 30, verses 12 and 13. So go ahead and turn there, Proverbs 30, verses 12 and 13. Here's what this one says. There are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. The word here for filth means excrement. This is literally the biblical version of acting like your bodily functions don't stink. Do you guys get that? That phrase originated in Scripture. I was amazed when I heard that this week. I'm not going to say it the way our culture says, but that is a a biblical principle. People acting like their stuff doesn't stink, okay? (laughs) Proud people think they've got it all together. That is a root of pride. They ignore their own faults, they ignore their own flaws, and they look down on others. They think they know better than God. They're not interested in receiving any kind of help or counsel. And such behavior reveals the kind of person that they are, that they are proud. Conversely, right, on the other side of that, you would have the humble. People who are willing to admit, I don't have it all together. I need your help. I want to grow in holiness. Please share with me what God has taught you in your life so that I can learn from it and grow. And I love the scriptures because they support one another. And so when Jesus is teaching in the New Testament, he has a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector in the Gospel of Luke that perfectly illustrates what we're talking about today. So listen to this. I'm going to share this parable from Luke 18. It even says, uh, he, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So even the setup of the parable is showing us this is exactly what we're talking about. Here's what he says. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I can get. Right? You can hear the pride just rolling out of that man's mouth. Consider the other person. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beats his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus' commentary after he shares the parable says this, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That's how things work in God's economy. If you're proud, if you boast, if you exalt yourself, God will oppose you. He will reduce you to nothing, right? He humbles you. If you are humble, if you have a right view of yourself, God will be the one who exalts you and lifts you up. And that takes us to our second takeaway here. What does God teach about pride and humility? You need to recognize the end of each path. Recognize the end of each path. Right? That's something we've heard over and over again in Proverbs. There is an end to each one of these paths. The path of wisdom leads to life. The path of folly leads to death and destruction. And by now we understand, I hope, that pride is synonymous with the way of folly. So can you guess how pursuing pride is going to turn out? Let me show you how it turns out. Proverbs 16, verse 18, makes it very clear. 
Proverbs 16, verse 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Could it be any more clear? It's right there. Right? This is taking you in the same path to the same destination that folly takes you. Destruction. Death. Pride never ends well. And that makes sense if you consider the fact that God opposes the proud. In Proverbs 15, verse 25, it says this, The Lord tears down the house of the proud. The Lord tears down the house of the proud. How's that for a visualization? Everything that you've built up with your life, if you're a proud person, God's right there just ripping it apart, tearing it down, because he opposes you every step of the way. Oh my. Pride is the anti-God state of mind, and he is not going to bless that path. You are setting yourself up against the creator of the universe. How do you think that's going to turn out? Not well. Not well at all. Thankfully, Proverbs shows us a better way. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 12 says this, makes the comparison here. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Humility comes before honor. There is another path that has a much different ending. It's the way of humility, which is synonymous with the way of wisdom, and it ends with life, with honor, and as we heard earlier in chapter 22, with riches. God blesses the humble. God exalts the humble. And one of my favorite passages that shows that is in the New Testament, in Romans 8. It displays the end of this path, the way of humility. In Romans 8, 28 through 30, here's what it says. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified, which means declared righteous. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's the end of the path of humility the path of wisdom. It's glorification. It's God giving you a new body in the new heavens and new earth. No longer being plagued by sin and sickness and death anymore. That is the hope that we have. How's that for an end to the path? All right, that's a pretty good deal compared to what folly and pride have to offer. Destruction on one hand, eternal life on the other pretty good deal. So I want to encourage you to make sure you recognize the end of these paths and that you choose wisely. See, the way of pride um, appeals to us, right? We, we follow it. It seems like it's going to give us what we want. You know, it puts us in a position of power, authority, um, perhaps of control. There are different things that we like about pride, and so we pursue it, but it's temporary. And as we just heard, its end is destruction. And that end continues for an eternity, so the cost is not worth it. It is a bad deal no matter how you look at it. So choose wisely. Choose instead to pursue the way of humility. That's our third takeaway for this morning. Pursue the way of humility. So you're here right now, right, obviously, in this room. You're getting an opportunity to hear from God's word. You're being challenged on what it looks like to put off pride and pursue humility, How are you going to respond to what God is teaching you, what he's putting on your heart right now? What does it look like for you to pursue the way of humility? Again, God gives us some clear instructions in the book of Proverbs. One particular response is to guard your heart. To guard your heart. And we're not talking about your your blood pump and vessel here. We're talking about your inner man, your inner woman. Look at Proverbs 4.23. Here's what it says. It says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Right? So again, not talking about your blood pumping organ, talking about your inner man, your inner woman, the control center of your life. You do what you do because you want what you want. That's what we're talking about. And the scriptures say, guard that with all vigilance. 
protect what you allow in there. Protect what you allow to rule you and control you. Later in the book of Proverbs in chapter 27, it says this, as in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects the man. Right? What you have in your heart reveals who you are. It shows us your character, the type of person that you are. And so if you've allowed pride to rule in your heart, meaning you're on the throne rather than God, then guess what? You are a proud person. You're revealing yourself by that. If you keep an eye on your heart, if you guard it with all vigilance, and you protect that throne so that only God is on it, then you will be humble. And I've got this really professional drawing here from Microsoft Paint to show you. <laughs> There's the heart, right? There's the throne. There's only one seat. Who's on it? Because whatever is ruling your heart is going to have inescapable influence over your life and your behavior. So if I'm on, my, on the throne of my heart, if I'm worshiping self, if I'm exalting self, I'm going to respond way differently to you and to my circumstances. If God is on the throne of my heart, that's going to change everything about how I respond to people and to situations in my life. And so you have to ask yourself, who's on the throne? Who is ruling me? Self? Or God. Guard your heart because the scriptures also make it very clear there are some serious consequences for letting pride or self rule in. Check out Proverbs 16, verse 5. Proverbs 16, verse 5 says, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Oh boy. Pretty, pretty straightforward there. God doesn't mince words on this. If we are proud in heart, if we, if we let this go unchecked, if we're not willing to repent of it, we are an abomination to the Lord. So the question we ought to be asking right now is, how in the world do I do this? How do I guard my heart? How do I stay far away from being ruled by pride? Good question. Proverbs gives us a few examples. Proverbs 25 verses 6 and 7 say this. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. It's the idea that you don't walk into the room and say, I deserve the seat of honor. Everyone look at me and how great I am. And that's pride. It's unwise to think too highly of yourself. You can let others decide if you deserve to have the place of honor Instead, what Scripture commends to us and Jesus' example to us is be a servant of all. Lay down your life for the good of others. That should be where we start. That needs to be our disposition or our demeanor that leads to our disposition. Look at this. In Proverbs 27, verses 1 and 2, we see another teaching here. It says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Let another praise you and not your own lips or your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. This is warning us against the danger of being a braggart or a boaster, which is also pride. So don't walk into the room and say, let me tell you about how great I am. Let me tell you about what my paycheck looked like last week or how great my kids are and how they obey, right? Those things are self-exalting. Those are boastful. They're, they're proud. Guard your heart against that. Let others choose whether or not they're going to give you praise. And when they do give you praise, glory to God. He is the one who is responsible for anything good that I've done. Proverbs 30, verse 32 has a funny way of putting it. It says, if you have been foolish, exalting yourself, or if you've been devising evil, put your hand over your mouth. All right? That's the visualization. Just cover your mouth and shut up. Stop talking. You're proud, you're boastful, you need to stop it, even if it means physically restraining yourself from doing so. Well, another way uh, that Proverbs tells us on how to put off pride is to be willing to confess and forsake sin. It takes humility to admit when you are wrong and when you have failed. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Right? If you act like you've got it all together, if you're not willing to admit when you are wrong, that is pride. 
God blesses those who confess. So be willing to admit when you're wrong. Be willing to ask for forgiveness and to humble yourself in that way. Another way to pursue the way of humility is one we've already heard about. It's to listen to and obey wise counsel. Listen to and obey wise counsel. Proverbs really commends that in the course of the book. You need to listen to wise counselors and be willing to change. It also warns us against the dangers of ignoring that counsel. We see the warning in Proverbs 13, 13. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself. But he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. Two more that give the blessings of listening. Proverbs 15, 31. The ear that gives or that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. In Proverbs 19, 20, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Listening and receiving wise counsel is commended. This is what we ought to be about. If you want to be known as a humble one, then be receptive of the teaching and wisdom of others. So this kind of begs the question then, who do you allow to speak into your life? Right? Who are those people for you? Is there anyone that you let speak in? Or do you hold everyone at an arm's length and say, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I know what's right and I'll just do it my way. Thank you. Are you in the habit of isolating yourself, cutting people off so that they can't see the ways you're struggling? Do you try to figure things out on your own? Some questions to be asking yourself. And if, if you trend towards that latter role of isolation and cutting yourself off, well, Proverbs has a word of warning for you. Proverbs 18.1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. God himself is saying, that is not how I've designed you to live. You were meant to be in relationship. We need one another and we need God. We can't cut ourselves off. When we do so, that is folly. We're inviting danger and destruction into your life. What you're hearing is that a humble heart is a teachable heart. And so if you're here and you're not willing to share the struggles of your life with others, there's a good chance that you may be proud. You need to be willing to let others in, to carry the burden with you, to confront you when you're sinning, to speak truth into your life. Around here, that happens in small groups. Are you inviting your small group into your life, or do you keep them at an arm's length and keep the walls up so they don't really know what's going on? And not only should you allow them to do that for you, but if you are a Christian, you should be doing that for others, loving them in the same way. Well, the final and the most essential way to pursue the way of humility is to entrust yourself to the humble one. See, ultimately, you and I, we can't pursue humility apart from Jesus Christ showing us the way. This is the very thing that Trevor was uh, reminding us of earlier when he read Philippians 2, right? Christ, God the Son, came down. He humbled himself. He took on human form, entered into his creation as our creator, and then died on the cross in our place, taking the wrath that was meant for us, humbling himself to die in a very excruciatingly painful and humiliating way, crucifixion. And Christ is the one who has made it possible for proud fools like me and like you to be transformed into humble saints, sons and daughters of God. But it only happens when we're humbled by what he's done for us. It's through his sacrifice that we're saved. We contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary and humility has to start at the cross. It starts when I recognize, Lord, I'm a sinner. I have fallen short of your standard, and I need you as a I need you to save me. I am a rebel against you, the righteous king. Please forgive me. Humility continues by asking for forgiveness. Lord, I realize I can't do it on my own. I need you to forgive me for my rebellion, my sin against you. And praise God, he delights to forgive sinners. He loves to do that. And humility finishes up by putting off sin, renewing our thoughts in the truth of God's word and pursuing the way of humility, the way of wisdom. It requires us to have a right view of God 
and a right view of self that leads us to worship. Right now we've come full circle. That's what humility is about. You've got to have a right view of God, and that comes through having a right view of who Christ is. He humbled himself so that you could be humble. So sit under his teaching, sit under his tutelage. He is the one worthy of praise and all that we have. And as we close out, I thought I would leave us with some words of wisdom from a very unlikely source. This is from the Marvel movie, Doctor Strange. And if you've never seen this movie, let me just give you some background here. The main character is a neurosurgeon by the name of Dr. Stephen Strange. And uh, he's a brilliant man. He's also incredibly arrogant and proud and thinks very highly of himself. And in the midst of his training to become one of the most powerful superheroes that the earth has ever known, his mentor has some very wise counsel for him. So let's listen in on that counsel. Arrogance and fear still keep you from learning the most simplest and essential lesson of all. It's not about you. Wise words from a secular movie. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Christ. Let's close by asking him to help us get our perspective in the right place. Lord, we just come to you right now, and uh, we're thankful for your word that, again, speaks so clearly on such a a real-life issue. And if we're being honest, and we ought to be, we are a people who struggles with pride. Lord, we struggle with exalting self, of thinking highly of ourselves, and, and frankly, lowly of you. We don't have the view of you that we ought. And so we ask right now that you would help us in this moment to be convicted of that, to help us to see ways that we need to put off pride, that we, that we might be able to serve you and, and serve others, love you and love others. And Jesus Christ, we're so thankful that you have shown us the way. This is not some teaching we read about in the word, but have no, nothing to look to, but we can look to you, Lord. You came down. You humbled yourself to the point of death, death on a cross for us. And so we have a great example to look to and to emulate. And so would you help us today as we walk out of here to put off pride and to pursue humility because that's what you've done. You are the perfectly humble one. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and close in worship of our great God.